Welcome everybody to the second part of our Communication for Janitors Climate Action Webinar Series. Today it's all about media advocacy and before diving into our webinar, I would like to give you some house rules to make sure everyone can follow the webinar properly. Next slide, please. So on house rules and accessibility, we will have translations today and you can find the translations by clicking on the small globe um, symbol that is at the bottom of your Zoom app and you can choose the language that you would like to listen to, either English, French or Spanish. Our accessibility coordinator today is Tara Daniel. To ca contact Tara, please write her a chat message via the Zoom chat or email her directly. In addition, if you would like to um, raise a question, please use the chat box. We will also have a question and answer discussion later on where you can also unmute yourself and directly speak. Um, and while you are not speak speaking, we would like to ask you to please mute your microphone, turn off your camera if it affects your connection, remove all distractions for you that you can be present and follow our presenter presenters, and please use the chat box um, for communication or also raise hands as already said. So please make yourself comfortable and um, our speakers today are Neha, Hannah and Mara that support the entire webinar series and they will take the chance to introduce themselves during um, their inputs. My name is Patricia Boland and I'm the coordinator, coordinator of the Women and Gender constituency and I'm happy to facilitate the webinar today. Next slide, please. Before going into the agenda, I would quickly like to take the chance and recap our first webinar on digital advocacy in the beginning of the month. So we have heard the great input from Neha on digital campaigns and um, discussed on how to plan a digital campaign, how to use hashtags the best way and how to strengthen a, gap, a digital campaign with, amongst others, videos, audio materials, photos and more. Nina also explained on how to create a social media toolkit and what different tactics can be used to strengthen your campaign in different social media channels. Afterwards, Hannah gave us an overview on useful tools supporting your digital advocacy and gave a deep dive into Canva to create a also visually great campaign. Amongst the participants, the most discussed topic was the digital, the digital divide, which is very important to consider. And we hope to add alternatives today, but we should also remember to not leave the digital space to others. Now going into the agenda of today, um, we have just ha heard the introduction and recap. Um, next, we will involve you all actively and ask you about your experiences. Afterwards, I will hand over to Neha, who will give us an input on media advocacy for our movements, focusing on community media, how to create press releases, how to organize a press conference, press briefings, or also media trainings. Afterwards, we will have a short session involving you again. Please remember to ask your questions via the chat box. Then after that, we will also have an input from Mara today on how to manage bad press. And afterwards, we will go into our COP25 case study and how we organized our media during COP25. In the end, we will have a question and answer and discussion session where you can directly speak and we hope to involve you more at the end. Having said that, I would like to go to our next slide. This webinar series is organized by the Women and Gender Constituency 
and get supports from our member organizations VIDU, APWLD and WECF. <clears throat> the Women and Gender Constituency has been founded in 2009, initially um, as an uh, observer constituency to the UNFCCC, and we have received our full observer constituency status in 2011. Um, our activists, researchers, and members of the constituency, however, have been involved in the climate negotiations for a much longer time. In 2015, we launched our Gender Just Climate Solutions Award program, of which many of you might have already participated in, and it gives us the chance to bring local action and local solutions directly to the international level. In 2020, we have now 33 member organizations, but those are only those organizations with an official accreditation to the UNFCCC. We do also have an active network of more than 500 groups of NGOs, but also of individuals. And if you are interested to join either our network or need support in your accreditation to the UNFCCC, please don't hesitate to contact us. But what does the Women and Gender Constituency do? We promote human rights, gender equality and effective partic participation of women in all the variety at all levels of decision making. Um, Foremost, of course, within the UNFCCC process, our goal is to provide a voice to women and to formalize and unify the perspective of NGOs working on women and gender issues within the UNFCCC process. When developing new positions, we make sure that members are given the space to raise their concerns and formulate our positions in a democratic and joint way. And we do always in involve also our advocacy network to contribute with their expertise. Moreover, we of course do also cooperate closely with other constituencies, but also with the climate justice movements to make sure we are building joint forces. Most importantly, of course, our final goal is, is to promote gender equality and women's rights in all global commitments, but in particular, of course, those that are related to climate change. Having said that, I would like to involve you more actively in our webinar series and dive into our content. And for this, I would like to hand over so as I said, that uh, messaging is really, really important. So your message has to be clear, it has to be crisp, it has to be really short. Um, it is also important because journalists get a lot of information every single day. When, when I was a journalist, I would get 100 press releases in my inbox in one day. And I wouldn't read through everything. I would just look at the subject line and decide which ones I was going to spend my time reading. Or, uh, you know, if, if the timing was correct, then I would think that what you sent to me was really relevant as well. So again, so that's, re that's where it's really, really important that your messaging is really short and crisp and to the point. Um, and some of the examples that I've chosen here are two media articles where one is just no planet B. And that's a really powerful message from, from the climate movement as well, that this is the only planet we have. We have to make this work for us. Right, and then uh, when we talk about fossil fuels, I think the the statement "keep it in the ground" and it's just five words, but it tells the message that hey, this is the demand from the climate movement. So again, so that's why it's really, really, really important that the messaging is correct. And then you see that whatever the content of their press release or the output they sent, and these were the keywords that media picked up and used it in their heading as well. So again, it's really good, good to be strategic. Excuse me, this is the interpreter. Can you please slow down a bit? Yes, yes. Sure. Thank you so much. So so yeah, so basically um, it's really important that, that uh, you play around with these words, but make sure that the message is very, very clear. 
All right, next. So again, uh, as I said that there are lots and lots of media outlets and it, they could be within your country, within your region or outside, depending on who you are trying to influence. So, um, so the idea is that you need to, to assess for yourself which media is most useful and which media is influential. So sometimes you may choose uh, an outlet which is really progressive and you think they will pick up your message. So you that's the most useful media for you. But if you're trying to influence uh, decision makers, then you you try and, and, and reach out to the big media within your country or within your region as well. So for me, the strategy that really works is I identify media which is local or national or global. And then I also have a list of identifying whether they are mainstream media or alternative media. So um, what does the word mainstream media mean? It really means the media uh, outlets that are really big and powerful and have been there traditionally for a very long time. So for example, BBC is a mainstream media or um, CNN is a mainstream media. Um, so, so these are just two, two really big examples and they are global media as well. Uh, an alternative media would be uh, a progressive media outlet that really listens to the voices of people and communities um, or gives a space to alternative voices as well. Uh, so, so for example, Al Jazeera while being a mainstream media also has that space uh, to talk about progressive issues or the Guardian as well. But you know, you would not go to the Daily Mail in the UK and talk about the climate issue because that's not their stance as a media outlet. So it's always good to identify what works for you uh, within your context as well. Uh, and again, it's always good to choose um, whether you want to go with a newspaper or a magazine or TV or a blog or even radio, because in some communities, some media uh, outlets are consumed much more than the others. So again, it's really important for you to identify these. Even if you can identify, I would say five, five big main media outlets out of this list and build a relationship with them, and that's going to help you. You don't have to reach out to 20 or 30 or 40, just, 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 focus on five that would work best with you and then keep expanding so that it's not overwhelming for you. Uh, and I'll also talk about the timing later as we go deeper into this presentation. Next. So I've just sort of put out, uh, you know, some of the uh, media outlets that are uh, there within uh, different regions of the world. Uh, again, if you look at Telesur and uh, it really puts out progressive content, uh, the Strait Times, while it is it covers news in the Southeast Asia region, can sometimes be not really progressive um, in in some countries. And also, you have to figure out what works for you within your context as well. So these were just some examples that I wanted to show. All right, uh, next please. All right, so um, the other thing uh, that that you can really work with is community media uh, within your uh, communities as well. Uh, and, and the reason is that community media actually uh, does give a voice to the community and it helps uh, connect their issues with, with, with each other as well. Uh, it also is a place where you can highlight the needs and the interests of the community as well. Um, and then also, if there are some solutions that the community is providing to certain problems, uh, it's a good space to sort of have that discussion or create that discussion space. Uh, and community media is also a really, really powerful tool for civic participation, for education, for community building as well. So, so sometimes, you know, when uh, we know the impact of climate change is felt much more 
by communities on the ground. So it's always good to have those voices be heard within the media space. And uh, from my experience as a journalist, I, I would have an eye on the community media, what has been spoken or what has been reported in that space. And I would pick it up for a news story that I was doing at a national or an international level as well. So journalists also tend to, to reach out to community media, the, the journalists that are in bigger cities. Uh, so again, that's a good point of, of contact and, and starting point as well. Sorry, next please. My keys are not working. All right. Oh. Right, uh, the next slide, please. Yes, um, all right, so when you reach out to journalists and it's always a question like, who do I reach out to? Who's going to listen to me? Um, so, so one type of journalists that are really interested in different stories are uh, freelance or independent journalists. And uh, sometimes these journalists, when I use the word freelance and independent, these journalists are not attached as full-time uh, employees of a media organization and they work independently. Uh, they produce new stories and they will give them to different media outlets. So, so for independent journalists, it's, it's, um, uh, they are much more flexible in listening to your stories, listening to stories from the communities, trying to find a way to work with you as well. So it's always good to build a relationship with independent journalists. Um, the other set of people who are really, really important uh, are what are called the beat reporters. So again, it's a technical term, but it's just very simply, it just means that uh, every journalist in a media organization is assigned to cover certain kinds of stories. So there would be a, uh, a journalist who would be covering environment and climate. There would be a journalist covering gender issues, a journalist who covers education, a journalist who covers politics. So it's always uh, good to identify these journalists. And usually if you read the newspaper, or you watch TV, you would see a name pop up. So you know this is the person that you need to contact because this is the person who covers these kind of issues. Uh, and again, this can be an intersection. You could be working on the climate issue from a gen gender lens. So you would reach out to, you could reach out to a journalist who either covers environment or covers gender issues, right? Um, or if you're doing uh, community education uh, on climate, then you could reach out to a journalist who covers education. So, you know, so those are different kinds of things that you can do and reach out to different sorts of journalists as well. Um, and then the other set of journalists who have to do, and, and these beat reporters, they actually have to do a story every day. So, which is always like good because they're looking for more content that, that they need to cover. And for you to be a source of that content, and once you build that relationship, then you can be featured more and more in, in their news stories as well. Uh, the other kind of journalists who really need to do stories are feature reporters. So usually they would have these big, big extra pages in the newspaper on the weekend, or it's a weekly magazine, uh, which, which does a lot of feature writing. Uh, and features are basically these long in-depth stories, which, which could be told from a personal point of view, a human interest point of view. And so these journalists, again, like, like doing deep dive stories. So it's always good to also build a relationship with them and reach out to them. Um, so with, and these sort of, the, there's a feature, there's a beat reporter and features reporter. And then above this set of journalists would be someone who is called the city news editor. So uh, the editors you also sometimes have the authority to tell a journalist to go and cover a certain story. So it's good to build a relationship with the editor as well. So it could be the city news editor, it could be the news editor who sits on top of the city news editor. Um, sometimes when you're trying to um, shape some sort of public discourse, you you will see that that there is an opinion page on in a newspaper as well. So, so this page is run by the edit page editor and they like uh, 
sometimes you know with, when you're talking about issues that that there is a lot of debate around them they like putting out different kinds of viewpoints so uh, so while one day which is they might put out content by a climate denier but next day you can say well i need a space to talk about why we are in a state of climate emergency so again it's it's always about finding you can write to them and say well i you know this is what i would like to write about and and they might just give you that space and again within the online media space this is much more easier and accessible uh, in the newspaper it's a little more harder to get your opinion out there but again it's up to you it's how you build that relationship with with these sort of um, these set of people um, the other place where journalists get their stories from is an assignment desk so every media outlet will have this one desk where which is getting like a lot of information on the events that are happening in the city in that day or uh things that are happening uh, press conferences that are happening and they'll pass it on to different journalists as well so you can actually just send say hey i'm doing a press conference today and send it to the assignment desk and if you can speak to them and that would that's great like they'll and just tell them to forward this to the relevant reporter if you don't know who to reach out to as well so these are different sets of people within a media outlet that you can reach out to for your news stories all right uh, next please all right so you've now gotten hold of a journalist and you're trying to talk to them so what are you going to talk about right um what journalists like to do is they'll do certain kinds of stories so and you have to figure out what you're trying to to tell them and in in a basically it's a way of what you're trying to sell to them fits into their mold of storytelling so um so basically then your ideas could be hey i think that could you do a story a feature story because i really want to highlight what's happening within my community so it's a human interest story or you say that hey we did this research which says that 60% of women are impacted by this xyz thing and these are our data findings so can you do a story and so you could probably pitch that to them then again as i ex explained you can do an opinion piece and that's a very direct impact that you're trying to create uh the other things that you can do is you can say hi i think there is uh we want to show you what's happening within our community or this is a innovation that we are doing or we this is how we are adapting to climate change and would you be interested in doing a photo essay on how it's changing people's lives or hey would you be interested in doing a short video right so these are different things that you can actually give as options to journalists when you talk to them Uh, and the last one is called hard news or straight news again it's a little bit of a technical term but um just very simply to help you understand that suppose uh your government releases a report today uh, saying that um you know our findings say that only only like 2% of the population population is impacted by climate change and you know that's absolutely ridiculous but you know that 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 report came out today so journalist definitely will do a story and you can immediately like just issue a press release saying well we don't agree with these findings you know so so then that's a story that that they have to put out and then they also put out the comment that that you also put out so that's a very straight story which like it gets reported exactly the next day and it sort of loses its value uh, if you decide to put out a press release 5 days later then you've lost that moment of challenging the the government narrative so that's just an example so these are stories that they have to do like you know every day it will probably be like in like one column on the front page or the second page or in the news uh, if it's tv news then probably it would be maybe like the second news item of the day or the third so you know so this is what the hard news is um all right next please sorry can i just go back yes so um so i just sh uh, shared like a couple of examples here um of different kinds of stories so um so you know one the first story that you see is a story which is what we call the hard news story uh 
which is something that happened at the UN and then it suddenly just became big news. Um, the second one that you see is an opinion piece uh, by an indigenous rights activist. And, and so that, that's, that's an opinion that has gone out into the media. And then the third example that you see here is a survey that was done uh, and that's become a new story. So these are different ways when you do your work, you can share it with the media in these sort of different ways. All right, next. Thanks. Um, so again, so journalists, you know, when you say that these are the different kinds of stories that you can do, uh, that is called angles and journalists have to always choose the angle to do the story from uh, because when a journalist does a story, they go to their editor and ed editor will say, so what's the angle? What's the new thing that you're trying to tell today? Because this, I've heard this before. So again, it's a theme that a journalist will choose and it's always really good to check with them uh, what they are thinking because sometimes they may be thinking something completely different. You're talking about a hey, climate, Clim we are in a state of climate emergency. And in fact, they are doing a story and well, it's not really, but hey, this one activist feels it's an emergency. So, you know, it negates the entire purpose of your message. So it's always good to have that sort of check with them like, oh, so like, you know, I was wondering like, what is the angle that you're trying to take for the story? Sometimes they may not be truthful in telling you, but again, it's, it's good to sort of have that check with them. And as I said before, uh, you know, with, with an angle, you can always try and convince them, oh, I think it's good you can do a community-centric story or, hey, why don't you do an issue-centric story or, hey, we did this new research, so why don't you cover that? Um, and the other thing is that once they've actually covered you for the first time, then you can always contact them again and say, by the way, you know, you covered us last time and this is a new development. So would you be interested in doing a follow up story? So that's also how you build a relationship with them once you've had that first point of contact with them. All right, uh, next. So the other thing that you can do um, is try and once you build some sort of a relationship with a media outlet, you can build like a semi-formal sort of partnership or collaboration as well. Uh, so for example, these are some of the examples where you'll see that uh, there's a media, online media called Open Democracy. And they have like a collaboration with the Open University where they highlight the stories of women entrepreneurs in, in Africa. But if you are working with different communities that are doing climate adaptation, and you could say like, hey, let's do a five part series together. So, you know, so those are different things that you can do. And then uh, another example is the Guardian that does, uh, they have a global development section on their website and they have a tie up with many different big, or uh, sometimes big and sometimes not so big uh, civil society organizations as well where they, they collaboratively put out uh, content together. Um, so again, these, I mean, these examples are big examples, but you can work small, you can work with your community newspaper, you can work with your local uh, media outlet to, to do a five part series uh, or, uh, or like a weekly series on highlighting some aspect of, of climate change. So again, that's another example that you can explore as well. All right, next, please. All right, so um, so the other thing that you need to do is don't be afraid of walking up to a journalist and introducing yourself. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a really, really important tip. Like in your head, just practice that pitch. Like in, one, in two minutes, I need to explain what what is who am I and what do I do and why is it so important for you to talk to me so um, and and journalists are always looking for new sources so so you you are like a source of information for them and journalists are always looking to build that relationship with civil society with with people with communities and always willing to listen as well. So I would say like, don't be afraid, just walk up to them and introduce yourself. Uh, and if you're at an event, 
uh, you will probably see like one person hanging around at the back with a notebook and like pen and like writing down something and that person is probably a journalist so so yeah so that's how you identify this one person in a corner and say hi are you a journalist oh okay and then have that conversation um the other thing and sometimes it can be overwhelming to go and talk to people uh, you can o- also do it over email so sometimes uh, especially with online media you will see that when uh, in a news article they'll also have like a, a email of that journalist as well or you can maybe like just find it if you go to a media outlets website you will see like there's a contact information available so you can just write a really short email introducing yourself and your organization and again explain what is the issue that you're working on and why it is important for them to cover that issue um again don't attach too many documents don't send too much information just enough like maybe like three paragraphs and that's it um and and always share your contact information in that email as well even at a event just make sure that you share your business cards with each other or at least get their contact details so that you can follow up with them um and if you are really from a movement from a frontline movement and you are trying to get media attention it's always really good if you have a blog i mean you may not have a website but like a blog or a online space where you have chronicled and documented the movement and the campaign that you are working on and you can send that link to them because journalists would always um you know at, if they're interested in a story they would like additional information and you can direct them towards that that page or 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 that information and say there is more for you to read as well so so that those are some some of the ways in which you can get a journalist attention if you don't know them already next please all right um the other thing that you can do and this is slightly labor intensive so it's it's only if you feel that you need to do it is do a media visit which is that uh, you build a relationship with them by visiting the media outlet uh when i was a journalist i would get a lot of phone calls from different different movements and civil society organizations who just wanted to come and talk about the work that they were doing it wasn't necessary necessarily always about covering them at that very moment for a new story but just getting to know that this is what we do so it's 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 always good to have that sort of contact and usually you can just do it in one day you can decide to go and visit five media outlets in one particular day so you don't uh, you know spend a lot of energy doing this again and again um and a good tip is to always research and see if that media outlet has covered your story uh, or your issue before uh so it's always then you can always use that as a talking point like oh i just noticed that you know you cover this issue quite a lot and we work on it as well so we were wondering if you would be interested in covering us uh and then you can actually go with a colleague who might be you know like an organizational expert in a specific issue if you have some sort of reports or briefs so just take that along for them to read through as well so they can read, read it later and then they can get back to you and as as always it's really important that you share your contact details uh it's good to start building a media database and this is one way to do it every time you come in 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 contact with a journalist just put it in your excel sheet like name contact details all right this is what they're interested in covering so that's how you start building that database for yourself as well all right um, excuse me this is the interpreter can you please slow down a little bit yes thank you next please all right so you've built that first contact uh, what do you do you keep in touch with them it's always good to give updates about your work in it could be a new report that you're coming out with it could be an event that you're organizing uh it could be something some just whatever update you think is like a media worthy update it's sort of good to have that um sort of not formal but like just sending an email out to them and saying oh just wanted to let you know this is what we are working on right now if you would be interested in doing a new story so so that's how it it's it's good to build that sort of relationship 
Um, and sometimes it does happen that you are stuck and you can't get access to government data or information. But a journalist can because they probably cover that issue. So they have to visit that government office and department every single day. And they have a relationship with that government official or a bureaucrat as well. So this also comes from my own personal experience when um, I was doing a documentary on farmer suicide in the Western part of India. And while I was there, I uh, there was a university professor who was uh, analyzing the the climate change data there uh, and trying to um, to corroborate that with the farmer suicide. Uh, but what he was stuck was with was he tried to uh, to access the uh, the met the meteorological department's ten year historical data, which was in Delhi, and they refused to give him that data. But because I was covering that documentary, I was going to the med department uh, in Delhi quite often. So they just gave the data to me and I just handed it over to the professor. So, uh, so yeah, so this is just one example of how you can also, once you have a relationship with a journalist, you can also use their help in accessing information that you may not have access to directly as well. So, so yeah, so that's something that you can do. And always remember that the journalists rely on you for their news stories as well. Um, and they need you as much as you think you need them. All right, next. So um, the other thing that I talked about previously is timing. And I think timing is really important uh, when you when you put out uh, your content for media advocacy. So one of the times that's really important is uh, around UN days. So the World Environment Day is important. Maybe Women's Rights Day is important. Human Rights Day is important. And there could be other days that you can identify uh, within uh, the scope of the work that you do. And you think that's really important. So just put out uh, some sort of media content uh, around that time. Uh, it could also be that there is a big global event happening. So for example, you know, COP25 is happening. Um, it's good to, to try and put out something, your press release or um, some sort of content out uh, before that, because you know, journalists are looking for a story. On those at those points of times uh, it could also be national events so for example uh, anniversary of a typhoon or an earthquake and you know that they will they will do stories around this so but for this it's always good to contact them in advance because sometimes they would actually like to do a whole one page feature or uh, you know like that edition of the magazine is just dedicated to that specific issue so if you contact them beforehand there is a higher chance that they may actually uh, cover you. Uh, and if you're doing an event on that particular day, there's a higher chance that they may come for your event and cover that event as well. So again, it's always good to think of that timing and to be a little more strategic as well. Um, and again, if, if there's a big disaster that has happened and you are putting out uh, media advisories, you are putting out press releases, uh, continue doing that. And if the situation changes, then again, um, uh, just just continue to put out content quite regularly. So, so yeah, so this is usually like a media calendar. So, you know, we know that as journalists that before a parliament session, we would do a story or we know that the budget, the annual budget is, is being announced, we'll do a story. So sort of just anticipate those sort of moments and try and use them for your own work. Next, please. So yeah, so this is just an example that I picked up from Nepal, uh, which is the earthquake anniversary and some stories around it because then there was a chance to talk about disaster planning. There was a chance to talk about climate change. There was a chance to talk about uh, how women die 
more in natural disasters. So, you know, if you're working on any of these issues, this is also a moment for you to strengthen your advocacy around it. It is also a moment for you to, to shape some sort of public discourse around this issue as well. So, so again, it's just being really strategic in, in making sure that as you are speaking to decision makers, you're also speaking to media at the same time. All right, next. All right, so press release. All right. So what I've seen is that um, within the civil society space, uh, sometimes we tend to write very long press releases. Once someone wrote a four page press release and um, I was like, if I'm a journalist, I would never read that. I would, if someone handed it to me, I would probably put it in the bin. I would not even read that email. So the key is that it needs to be one page. That's it, four paragraphs, one page, nothing more. Uh, maximum one and a half pages. So, um, and so this is a, this is a skill that, that, that you need to, to try and like learn. Uh, it can be a little hard and it needs to uh, be really tight and short as well. So, and because, you know, the thing is that sometimes as a journalist, if you read a press release, and you need additional information, you would actually contact this person and get more information. So not everything really needs to go in that, in that document. What needs to go in that document is your really, really key message. Um, and again, it's good to have a quote from say at least two people, three people, four is actually a bit high, but like yeah, two to three people is good. And again, it could be someone from the community. It could be someone from your organization. Uh, it could be, whoever you think can tell that message the best. Um, so, so again, so be strategic in choosing who you are quoting within your press release. And a press release should have quotes from different people. Uh, it should have a clear message. It should have your, say, your demands or whatever you're trying to tell. And then three people talking about it from three different aspects and really not repeating what the person before them has said, but rather adding on to it to be able to tell the entire story. So uh, the other thing that you need to do with the press release is try and send it out by afternoon, by before two o'clock or by two o'clock. I would say by actually 12 is the best if you can send it out by 12 because the journalists actually decide around 10 or 11 in the morning what story they're going to pursue for that day. So if you send something at the end of the day at four o'clock, it's definitely not going to get picked up for that day's news because the paper has to be laid out uh, by, by 10, stories have to be filed by 6 p.m. Similarly for TV news, so for six o'clock bulletin, you are done by 4.35 unless it's a really breaking news situation. So if, if your timing is not right, no one is going to read that press release. So for me, I actually, plan and prepare my press release a day in advance. And only on, the, on that particular day, there might be some minor changes in the content that needs to go out. So it's sort of like 90% done before the day. And so that, that's, that's a tip from me. Uh, the other thing that you can do is to send out to wire services. So organizations like Reuters, AP, AFP, these have reporters in many, many different parts of, uh, of con countries and regions where not, you know, not, not every media outlet will have a reporter everywhere. So all media outlets actually subscribe to the service where, where journalists from these outlets are filing stories every second. So, you know, we have like a big computer and then the stories keep getting added to it. So if your story actually, and then uh, gets added to this, there is a, there's a really high chance that it would get picked up by, by a mainstream media outlet. And these are considered reliable sources. So not, you know, uh, so when a newspaper, the page has to be filled, not all 10 stories that you see on one page is done by the reporter from that media organization because they don't have uh, the bandwidth to do it. So they rely on these, these wire services to fill out certain sections in the in a news 
uh, in a newspaper as well as on TV as well, the visuals that they get. Um, so, so yeah, so basically you can actually choose to, to send it out to via services which are in your country or international via services. And again, in a press release, like don't for, forget to add your contact information as well. All right, next please. So this is actually just, I know it's not very clear, but I wanted to show you this press release. It's just four paragraphs long. And this is something that we put out before COP24. And it got picked up by a lot of media because the message was strong. The content was strong um, and it was very clear. Um, next, please. So, um, so, so this is just an example of sort of making sure you have a strong headline in a press release and then there's like an about section and a contact section. So, so just I've just picked out key things which you can put out in a press release. All right, uh, next please. So again, uh, if you're doing a press conference, uh, it's not very wise to do a press conference often. It, only do it if there's like something really, really important that you cannot tell through a press release. Uh, so, you know, either it's just something very, very new as a data, which is, which changes a lot of things or, uh, you know, or if there's been like gross violations or something really big has happened. Otherwise, it's, it's not, it's resource intensive, it's time intensive, uh, and it's not really very useful. So again, it's not a best strategy. It's only like once in a while sort of strategy to use. Uh, and again, the same rule applies, just do it in the first half of the day, have two to three different speakers. Uh, when journalists come, just give them an issue. Of, basically, you have to issue a press release when you do a press conference. Um, so just sort of give it, give the press release to, to the journalists after they've listened to the speakers because otherwise sometimes journalists just take your press release and leave as well. Um, and it's always good to have that, uh, good to have like fill them out, fill, uh, have them fill out like a contact sheet as well. All right, thank you, next. So just sort of, uh, uh, this is just an example of a press conference invite that uh, you send out to journalists a couple of days before, make sure you have a title, make sure you have a date and time and venue already. And if it is possible to be organized ahead to send a list of speakers as well, so that journalists are sort of aware who's coming and whether they're interested in covering this as a story as well. So sometimes if it is someone from the community and this is something that would interest the journalists quite a lot because com community voices are not heard that often. So again, it's up to you to decide what works for you. Uh, but it's good to send as much information ahead of time as possible so that they can make an informed decision. And basically you're trying to convince them to come to your event, right? All right, next. So uh, another tactic that uh, sometimes uh, we do use is a press briefing, which is when you know the issue is really contentious. So for example, this is a strategy we used uh, when the Regional Economic Comprehensive Partnership, which is a free trade agreement was, it's currently being negotiated. Uh, and uh, so, so governments have a very different position on free trade agreements from us. So while these negotiations take place, we also do small media briefings with journalists and which is where we invite four to five journalists for like a small discussion and tell them that, hey, this is the issue. This is the concern that we have. Um, and we, you know, have like two to three people or one, one to two people from your side talking about the different issues or uh, different angles and sort of just giving them informal information. So it could also be a briefing that you would do if some sort of contentious negotiations were happening or some kind of discussions were happening with the government, but you still want to influence the public opinion. Um, 
So yeah, so this is a strategy that you can use. And we actually use this in Indonesia during the Indonesian round of RCEP negotiations. We did the media visit and the press briefing both. And we did see a significant change in how the media covered the next round of RCEP negotiations within the country. Uh, a lot more space was given to civil society and civil society views. So again, this is a tactic that you can use uh, during the course of your advocacy work as well. Next, please. All right, so again, if you're doing an event, it's good to send an invite ahead of time. It's good to call up journalists one day before and remind them that please come for the event. Uh, and if you do an event, then issue up a press release. If there are some, if, if you're sending out just an email, press release and an email, then attach one or two photos as well. Um, share your briefers, share your reports, whatever information packet that you have or which you think might be useful for journalists, share it with them. Uh, the other thing that I do at our events is I go and talk to journalists one-on-one -on -one and ask them if they need more information. If they need to interview a specific person, then I, I would help facilitate that as well. So that you, know, you want to make that news coverage more sort of rounded. You don't just want it to come out of a press release and you want to push a certain opinion. So you kind of know that, okay, so this is the person from my community or from my organization who can really amplify this message. So try and encourage facilitating these one-on-one -on -one interviews as well, because they help really shape a story of a journalist as well. And again, as I always say, keep contacts, because I know uh, with my experience within the movement, we tend to not not ask a journalist, hey, what's your contact details? So, so, so that really helps building your media database. All right, next. So this is just an example uh, in, in, in Bangkok, we actually, in, in, in India, we, again, with the RCEP negotiations, we use these sort of different strategies and we did get various results from our media strategies. Um, the first one was a protest that the civil society organized and we did a press release. We did one-on-one -on -one media interviews as well, especially community members and women who were being impacted by this trade agreement. Uh, again, we did another, and since we couldn't do something similar in, in, in Thailand, so we changed our strategy and instead did a small press briefing and, and, and additionally we did a press conference later as well. So you see the output from that is, is, is new stories that are talking about our point of view. Next, please. All right, so um, the other thing that, that you can do, and this has also worked for us, is to organize trainings with journalists. So for example, a lot of journalists don't understand the technicalities of climate change, or they cannot follow the climate uh, negotiations, or they don't understand really understand the sustainable development goals. So you can actually, once you have a media database, you can actually do like a one day or a two day workshop to, for them to understand the issue that you work on. And this is something that um, uh, a lot of organizations that used to work uh, on violence against women, on gender issues and LGBTIQ rights, they actually use this sort of uh, method so that because sometimes the language is really problematic how they're reporting a story is really problematic so you know so you really want them to understand as well um, and so you can organize this sort of a, a training uh, in fact one of our partner organizations did this in in sri lanka they did this training and then they did see a shift in the news coverage after that on the sdgs so, so this is something that you can try, but again, it's up to you to see whether you have resources and time and labor to do this. Next, please. 
all right so you've done your press conferences you've put out your content how are you going to monitor whether it's working or not so um there are two two to three things that you can do one is you can create a google alert and sorry we don't have enough time to walk you through how it works but if you go to uh, google.com/alerts and you can create a alert uh, you can put in a keyword so for example my keyword is the name of my organization apwld and every time in google news the word apwld comes uh, i get an email saying google alert apwld has been quoted in this news story so that's one way for me to keep track of the media coverage that we are getting and then the other thing that i actually do is to put everything in a excel sheet as well so um so i'll put the name of the article and the date it was published and i will have my database as well um and at the end of the year you can look at that database to see what worked for you what did not work for you where you can improve upon so that's your mel of your of your media advocacy as well uh, next slide right and then it's always good to have a contact list so this is just an example i wanted to show to you so i have a list of names organizations email addresses um and yeah if you have additional information so you can build this sort of a list for yourself all right next these uh and this is just uh, i just wanted to share this is how i organize my media coverage and then i can reflect on it as as the year progresses next please all right so i think that sort of brings to me to the end of this part and i believe mara can take over or pat Thank you so much, Nea, for your great presentation. And thanks so much for the first questions in this regard. Um, please don't feel shy to ask more questions. Um, I think there have been a lot of support that this has been very practical and useful. Um, but it would be great if you still just write your questions into the chat box um, that we can go through them later on. Thanks so much, Nia, and uh, we will hand back to you just in a minute. Um, but first, I would like to introduce Mara, who will go through the part of managing the so-called bad press. Mara, you are Thanks, next. Pat. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Neha. Please take a break, get some water, catch your breath. You've given us so much incredible information um, and tips and tricks for the last hour or so. Um, I learned a lot, and I know that um, this piece on managing bad press is, is an area of developing skills in our media advocacy that we all hope doesn't happen. Um, but to be realistic, there will likely be some moments in which we should really have some skills and tools to figure out how to manage uh, journalists who don't cover stories the way that we hope that they would. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a couple scenarios around how bad quote unquote bad press might transpire and possible tools to keep in your toolkit for how to respond. So I tried to group together four possible scenarios in which bad press um, might happen. And this looks very different. And I think this can look very different and have um, really different levels of, of severity. Uh, and significance that will determine your response as well. So first category, which I would say is the um, is frustrating, but it's certainly not the most concerning scenario. And this is something that feminist movements, especially and climate movement movements as well, handle all the time. And that's simply coverage and news and articles that is really oversimplified and reductive. Um, this can mean that it, it loses some really important context or history to give the full picture. It can mean that um, all of the work that you put into an action or a march or an event was just left out so that it feels like you're missing so much of the details. Um, 
and it can feel very frustrating because it feels like your your wholeness and your whole story wasn't necessarily represented in the news piece that you saw. Um, and this could also look like, for example, Neha was talking about having a one page um, press release. This could look like someone taking, you know, one sentence from your press release and integrating that, but forgetting to include the rest. So there are a lot of ways in which a story that you get can feel frustrating and can feel bad because it doesn't necessarily represent your full work. Uh, the second category that I think is similar, um, but can feel a little more um, personal is, is coverage that misquotes or misrepresents you or your organization or the movement that you're a part of. Um, so for example, if a journalist is talking to you and takes a quote, but then uses it in in a different context in the article in which you I never would have said that in the first place. Um, sorry. Um, this also could happen with, for example, someone um, really feeling like, you know, I was included in this article in a way that I didn't think that I would be. Um, and this feels mi misrepresentative to my full cause or what I was really advocating for at this event or in this interview. And this can feel very frustrating as well, obviously, um, but is a little different than being oversimplified because it feels like something that you might need to personally address to correct. And then there are these second two categories, which I think are, are much more harmful. Um, and that's bad press that either perpetuate stereotypes or harmful narratives uh, or coverage that is, is actually malicious to your cause. So, you know, I think that we all have had experiences of reading coverage that talks about feminist movements, for example, in really degrading and negative ways. Um, and it can be particularly frustrating when, for example, an event that you're working uh, or that you put on or a quote that you provided is used in one of those articles um, because it can feel like you were really taken advantage of and like your cause was not well represented, let alone that the article is painful and perpetuates um, wrong and, and harmful stereotypes or ideas about what you are fighting for. Um, so if those are the four categories of press that is just not great, there are several different ways that we can really think about how to respond to them. Um, so next slide, please. And there are a lot of different strategies and some of these will be more applicable to um, different categories than others. So first, something you can think of as a tool in your toolbox is actually just asking the journalist who wrote this article for a correction or an amendment. Many times if you go to um, mainstream news outlets, you'll see at the bottom of the article, there will be a section that's in italics that will say correction to the article. And often that's something like someone's name was misspelled, someone um, asked for their quote to be changed because it included uh, something that they didn't actually say. There's lots of ways that articles, particularly with reputable journalists, have to be corrected after publication. So you, especially if like, you, like, ne like Neha talked about, build up a relationship with a journalist, this is a really um, easy tool to always use if you think that there needs to be something really added to this article to be fair to you. Um, and a, a second option that is similar but is a little more autonomous is writing a letter to the editor. Often newspapers or outlets that might cover you as, as a news article also have a space in their same outlet where folks can write letters to the editor about their disagreements or, or strong opinions. Um, and so you could use that space to say, I didn't agree with this piece. I took issue with this particular part of it and here's why. And then that piece will be available and on the same website or the same outlet that, that the original article that you had an issue with was. So that's another option. A third that is similar, but is not necessarily um, going to be on the same website or the same outlet is to publish a press release from your individual or organizational perspective that actually illuminates your narrative. 
So particularly if a piece, um, if a piece comes out that you think really perpetuates harmful stereotypes or harmful narratives about your movement, uh, is saying lies about the feminist movement, is saying um, things that are just not true about your work, publishing your own press release to say, no, I'm taking back this narrative and this is the truth, here's what actually happened, is a really powerful way to point folks to um, your perspective and to say, I'm not just going to take this article and do nothing, I'm going to put my, my narrative out there too. Uh, and then of course, the second piece of that is making sure that people see it. So publicizing that response, whether that is a formal press release or it could just be a statement, um, a collective statement that is on your website or on your Twitter or on your Instagram or Facebook or over email or over WhatsApp, um, really publicizing that response by building social media enthusiasm for it and ensuring that lots of folks who might be reading that initial article that was harmful are also reading this collective response and they can see that there is a real difference. Um, and then the last option, which is definitely the one that would take the most work, but is really important if you think an article was, was particularly malicious, um, is to make sure that there's other media that is telling a different story. So often this will look like if there is, for example, a quite conservative media outlet uh, that is telling a story about um, feminist movement building that is really harmful, what are the other media outlets who would be interested in, in writing your story and writing a story that is more closely tied to the truth of the narrative and is not as interested in spinning it uh, into, their, into their particular narrative of choice? So this could look like alternative media sources, so using podcasts or using YouTube um, or using blogs. What are other ways that we can find outlets that could tell um, a coordinated response story as well? So these five strategies are tools that you should always feel equipped to use, um, and they will always be they will always be at your disposal. It's just a matter of how much time and energy you're willing to to put into handling bad press um, and responding to it. And I think that. As, as Neha will talk about in a moment with a case study, there are certainly cases where it's just not worth your energy and it's better to just ignore an article that doesn't necessarily talk about your, your event or your work in the best possible way. But then there are other moments where it's really key to make a powerful, strong statement that says you won't stand for this kind of misrepresentation. Um, and it's really about doing the analysis of figuring out where, where on that spectrum um, your response could lie and how best to respond. So next slide, please. I'm gonna pass it back to Neha quickly for this slide and then we'll move into the poll, Neha. Thanks, Mara. And um, these, the points that Mara raised were really, really important. Uh, we need to be aware that that our words can be misrepresented, can be twisted, but we also have recourse to that as well. So, um, so just sort of zooming out from from the technicalities of what we can do. Uh, if you look at overall, we can see that currently in our countries and globally, the media industry itself faces many challenges. And the narrative is dominated by governments and governments have a lot of money and resources to push their agenda and their propaganda. Similarly, corporates also have a lot of money and resources to do that as well, which means that a lot of neoliberal, patriarchal, anti-people, uh, you know, uh, messaging become, goes out and gets amplified again and again. And then the other challenge is that a lot of media is not independent anymore because, you know, this is how the industry is built and, uh, and there is, you know, um, corporate capture of media, there is suppression of media and especially media that is free or fair or independent, suppression through laws and policies. Uh, and again, attacks on journalists as well. So, so knowing that this is the macro view, this is where we are at that level, we can still overcome these challenges. We can still fight these challenges. 
if we are strategic if if many of us are putting out similar points of views if many of us are challenging this narrative then then media has to listen to us so so we are in that space where we can be strategic we can shape the discourse uh, and we can change that narrative we can take it back so uh, so for me i think the hope here is that when when you all go back you all you know uh, try and populate the media spaces within your communities and countries to to challenge whatever narrative is is taking place um so yeah so we sort of like zoom out on that and reflect a little bit on it, on that um while understanding that 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 this power can be shifted uh, if collectively are we can have a coordinated response as well um so with that i hand this back over to mara thanks neha yes let's continue to challenge dominant narratives Okay, so let's zoom out for a moment and just actually talk about um, which of these tools we feel comfortable using. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll in just a moment. And you'll see the question really is, there's two, which do you feel comfortable using? And which of these are not working for you right now? And the options are, um, first, working with community media radio interviews, press releases, press conference, press briefing, media training, and then the same question for which you don't feel comfortable using. So this is really a piece for us to understand of all of the, of all of the different tools that Neha just gave an overview to, which are new to you and which do you feel really comfortable using? Um, in which, uh, which might be useful for us to think through more trainings or more skill building in the future. Um, many of these are familiar to some of you and some might be new, so we're interested in learning which are which. So looks like lots of folks are comfortable working with community media. That makes a lot of sense, I think. If you are having relationships with journalists, it's likely those are gonna be journalists who are living in your communities, folks who are familiar with your work um, rather than sort of national or global outlets. I definitely relate to that. Um, about half of folks are comfortable with radio interviews. Uh, that's really good. That makes me, that, those always make me nervous. Um, more than half of folks are comfortable writing press releases, but almost no one is comfortable doing press conferences. That's really interesting. Um, and about a third of folks feel like press briefings and media trainings are something that they're comfortable doing. Um, and looks about the same, same sort of takeaways from what isn't working for folks. This is really interesting for us as well to think through, you know, maybe if folks are not comfortable having press conferences or hosting their own press conferences, that's a space where we can work together to really build up those skills um, because that's a key space in which we can really put our own stories out there and challenge dominant narratives. Give a few more seconds for folks to continue voting. We're a little over half who have voted right now. I'm seeing, yeah, folks are still really comfortable with community media, which is really awesome. I will say as well, it's very exciting that folks feel like local media is something that they can work with because it's a really important space um, to ensure is challenging the dominant narrative of national and, and government media. Um, great. Okay, I think I'll leave this up for a few more seconds. Um, so we can keep tracking the responses and take note of some of the themes. But I'm gonna to pass to you Neha to walk us through a quick case study to learn a little bit more about how to handle press that might not be so great. Thanks so much Mara for taking us through the poll. I can very much relate with all of you actually. Um, and I hope that 
through Neha's presentation, all of us can actually feel more comfor comfortable in doing different stuff. And in particular, the media trainings, I have never thought about it before. So I think that was a very good hint to get people on board and learn more about the topic we are working on in our movements. So now we are looking into the media strategy during COP24 last year, COP25, apologies. And I will just hand back to back to you, Neha, to go with us through the case study on how we did our media strategy there. Thanks, Mara. Thanks, Pat. Um, so I, since I gave you these menu of options, I also wanted to show you how we actually implemented that over a span of two weeks while we were at COP last year. Um, and you know, climate is such a contentious issue and we have so many issues where uh, governments don't really want to accept this as a climate emergency. So, and the challenge, the challenge is to really uh, counter that sort of dominant narrative. Uh, that's also backed by a corporate agenda as well. So what we did was we decided to have uh, a whole plan around this where uh, the outcome of that was coverage in over 80 media outlets across the globe, uh, including the big international media to even like the local media uh, that were present at COP. And we used these menu of options um, which, uh, which led to these results. So, so how did we achieve this? Um, so we did a bunch of different things. Um, next slide. All right, so we had a inside outside strategy. And so while COP25 is a case study of, of an international advocacy space, uh, whatever, as I walk through this, whatever you, uh, you see, you can also try and implement this within your own movements and within the work that you do as well. So it's just translating this into into your own work. So for example, while uh, constituency members, the WGC members were, were going inside in different spaces, in different negotiation spaces, and were amplifying the, uh, the message of the constituency there uh, and challenging what was, was being spoken inside by governments. We had a similar strategy for the outside space, which is the space which was for media advocacy and digital advocacy. So one of the things that I did immediately uh, after reaching the COP menu was to identify where the press center is, which is usually somewhere at the back in a corner, but that's where all the journalists get a space to you know, sit and they have a desk and they, they send their stories from there. So which means that you go there and you literally go and you can talk to like 100 people in one go, which is fantastic, but you would not get an opportunity if you try to do it uh, you know, in any other place. But COP really gives you that sort of opportunity to reach out to journalists from lots of different countries, lots of different media as well. So the first day I went, I explained what the WGC was um, and they were a bit hesitant, like, okay, who's this new person? We don't know, but then that's, that's your job to build a relationship, right? So then I would visit them every day with our positions, I would also identify like one person from the constituency and take them along and say, well, this is our expert if you need a story from, from this region of the world, or this is an expert on this particular issue. So, so you know, if someone is talking about the gender action plan, I'm like, hey, this is an expert who can give you an opinion as to what's happening inside. And what is our point of view on this? Or, hey, you're doing a story on on Latin America and there are these frontline climate defenders and you would want to speak to them. So, you know, so always thinking that what would work for them as a story. So that's how I started to go every day and build that relationship. And again, working on these different angles as well with journalists. All right, next. So the other thing that we did was we also issued, kept issuing press releases at various key moments, uh, which also included, say, right at the beginning, that these are the demands of the w, WGC. Uh, this is what we expect to get out these get out of these negotiations. So you know, it's, it's always good to state your position 
before because when journalists are doing their story on day one they're like what to expect at cop this year and there goes in your position because you've decided to put out that press release and statement but then we would do an action and then we would put out a press release if we were part of the climate march we put out a press release so you know so those were different moments that we kept identifying in the course of those two weeks and we kept putting out our press releases at those times and of course like sending it over email but also physically going and distributing copies to journalists as well and then asking do you need more information do you need to interview someone so you know so that process kept continuing throughout those two weeks next so i feel like we i can't show the video but basically uh, the other thing that we did was that collectively when we did uh, a lot of actions we also had a media strategy around it um so some actions were actually uh like pre allowed uh, to happen at the venue so which means that we can inform the journalists and say at this point of time we are going to be here and why don't you come and cover this action so it has to be visually appealing as well for journalists to cover it but it is also a good time for you to hand out your press release to them so what you will see is like a little quote that i pulled out from our press release and which says in a strong show of solidarity so these are the dif different movements that came together and this is what their demand was so and then you have photos to go with it and then uh, we got a, a lot of coverage out of this particular action that happened within the cop venue next please and so this is just another example of doing another action at the venue we put out a press release or you can actually use this for your like you know the visual part of it you can also use it for other advocacy that you do as well uh and again you will see that uh, the rapist is you was a song that that uh, that that uh, started from 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 latin america region but at cop we actually changed the lyrics a little bit to talk about the climate injustices uh and then we weren't allowed to do the action inside but we did it anyway outside um and then we did put out a statement saying well this is what we did so sort of like realizing that this is a moment when everyone is talking about this chant we also did an action around it as well next so uh, the other thing that we did was we identified spokespersons for different issues as i said before so you know you see one person is an expert on gap another person is an expert on something else and making sure they are quoted in the in the press uh and then again with journalists i always asked are you looking for a voice from the pacific are you looking to talk to someone uh from from this particular part of asia you know so you know it's always having that conversation and and identifying the right people for different issues uh the other thing that we did was we we held press conferences at regular intervals as well and again sent out invites to journalists prepared press releases made sure that that uh, our voices were being heard within that space and there are a lot of press conferences that happen in in a day um so you have to be a little uh, strategic and smart about the messaging to make sure the journalists actually come to the room and you hand over the press release to them but even if they don't turn up just send the press release to as many journalists as you know so again that worked for us not everyone had the time to come to the press conference but anyway was doing a story on from a gender lens and you know used our press release for their news stories next please um and then again uh the other thing that that was really really interesting was the the climate march because it was the biggest uh climate event that was happening in madrid at that that point of time uh and there were thousands and thousands of people so so with our uh, block the feminist block um we had very visually interesting props we had very strong feminists right there in the front chanting so and we had really powerful banners as well and i'd also prepared a press release so 
as journalists would walk past, I would go and introduce them to our feminist block and say, look, these are the feminists. They've come from these many different countries and they're here, they're demanding climate justice. So why don't you cover? So, you know, we got a lot of coverage because it was absolutely powerful to see all these amazing WGC members right there in the front. And then we had these really interesting visual visual props to go with it with had which had their own story as well so again we got a lot of coverage out of this as well so that was a key moment to also push for stories from a gender lens next please yes and then this was like a big moment where when we knew the negotiations were not going the way they should uh a lot of civil society in fact this was like a coordinated uh, in, uh action that we did together where uh, as you can see civil society was actually pushed out of the cop venue and some of us were debadged and that was a really important moment in what was happening outside and inside to be heard by the media so again uh, again because this action happened very suddenly we didn't have a press release on that particular day but what we had was a lot of media and for them to see what was happening as we were being shoved outside. So it was just making sure that media was able to capture that and capture our stories and and cover it in as many different media outlets as well. So that's that that was something that we did that day. Uh, next slide. But what really sort of happened on, on, on that day was while the media was really supportive of us. Um, oh yeah, Hannah says we had a cross constituency press release. Yes, that very night we did put that out. Um, but so we, while we were really, um, um, what's the word? Yeah, so sorry. Uh, so, so, so while, uh, you know, the, the, the media was actually really positive in its response to us at the beginning. But by the end of the day, the governments and, and UN sort of took over the narrative. And the narrative was like, these are people who are disturbing the negotiations, which is slightly problematic because then they say that you are actually uh, responsible for the negotiations not going through. Um, so we sort of changed it around that narrative by by saying that we were protesting peacefully and that this happened with us so and then making sure that we actually when we put out that press release we also put out testimonies of of the women who were there uh, it was also uh, we also put out photos and videos as of that as well so that media could see what had actually happened and this is the narrative from our side um next slide please so so you see like our press release on that day was very very strong and we talked about the backlash we talked about how there are frontline defenders here who are directly impacted by the climate crisis who are directly impacted by the decisions within those rooms and this is not acceptable to us at all and uh, so that was a very strongly worded press release that we put out. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you will see the, Guardi the Guardian has actually picked this up. Uh, while whatever the heading says, the second line says, campaigners frustrated at how women and indigenous people have struggled to have voices heard, which is exactly from our press release. This paragraph in the Guardian story is, is, is from our press release, which really talks about our narrative. So in that way, we were able to challenge that dominant narrative at COP. Um, so yeah, so these were some of the strategies that we used uh, at COP25 to make sure that we were being heard and we were constantly challenging the narrative that was pushed onto us and pushed onto public as well. So, so yeah, so that was something that we did at COP. Uh, next, please. I think this is the last slide. Yep, that was my last slide. <laughs> All right, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nia. This has been a great insight and actually also nice to just uh, memorize about our last um, climate 
conference we had. So now we would have time about maybe five to seven minutes for some answers. And maybe I can just give you the first question on the last piece of the presentation, um, Nia, which was how many press releases did you or did we publish over the um, two weeks of the conference? And it has been asked by Luby. And before you answer, I would just like to encourage everyone to just either type in your questions into the chat box or maybe indicate with a hand or a star in the chat box that you would like to unmute yourself and then you can just raise your question um, via audio yourself. Thanks so much. So the question, just to repeat for the interpreters, has been on how many press releases have been published over the two weeks of the climate conference. I, I think we put out around five or six, six press releases. So one at the beginning and then one, I think, at the march, then a couple at the, at the different protests that we did. And then towards the end, when we were trying to push for the gender action plan, and then one right at the end when the negotiations were ending, because uh, there were some things that were still not being pushed through as well. So again, just choosing those moments through, during those two weeks, I think five or six. Oh yeah, and then a couple of them at the press conferences. Thanks, Hannah, for reminding me in the chat box. If there is a follow-up question on that, don't hesitate to just ask it. Um, we also had a first question in the um, chat box for the first part, and I will try to slowly read it and hope that you can understand it. Um, it has been raised by Trupti. So Trupti, if you would just like to raise it yourself, if you are still in the training, you are welcome to do so. Um, but I will just quickly read for the moment. So the question is, um, if you Nia, can guide the participants about a structure of the team or of the respective positions in a national newspaper and their decision-making power. And I think now comes the question, what should be their priority and how to negotiate with them? So I do think it's about the relationships you can do with the um, um, newspaper teams. Mm. Maybe you can just say a little bit more about it. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel that it's really important to build a direct relationship with the reporter uh, because the reporter uh, will be able to push certain things uh, within the organization. So and, and because they cover that specific issue, so they are sort of taken as like an authority on that particular topic. Uh, but however, because of, you know, how sometimes there is a lot of corporate pressure, so the story gets what we call in the media, it gets killed, like they have a good intention of doing the story, but the editor is like, no, it doesn't work. So, so I think those are the moments when it's also useful to have some sort of a relationship with the editor and I would say maybe the city editor because I think that's the person who might be more accessible to you. Uh, the most senior positions like editor in chief and like, you know, the senior positions, they will probably not entertain uh, you or will respond to your questions or queries. So perhaps, yeah, these are your two contact points. And I think there are more hands raised, I think in the chat box. So the first hand I saw was from Faustina. So maybe you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions and I will check back for more questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's actually uh, going to be a contribution. Uh, you talked about um, getting the bad press and you said that you could be misquoted or you could, you know, they could just take a line and be mischievous about it, you know, and say untruths and all that. What I wanted to alert us is that not to um, say something and say that this is an aside, you know, or 
talk behind the scenes, journalists listen to uh, and, and take advantage of, you know, sort of the bad thing in quotes that you would say inadvertently or even talking to a friend or after the, after the press conference, you are discussing something with a friend or a colleague outside the box. They listen to things that they think are odd and go and change the angles of the whole press conference to suit their, themselves. So we need to be careful what we say outside we need to be careful not to say this is off record because sometimes we, we, we say things at press conferences or at media meetings and all that and say, but this is press uh, off record. For journalists, this is, there's never anything like an off record. So this is what I wanted to draw our attention to. Thank you. Thanks so much for Sina to sharing for sharing your experiences. Uh, maybe Mara, have you anything to add on this remark or also Neha, how to deal with it once maybe you by accident say something that is taken up by a journalist which should not have been published? Yeah, I would just say I'm yeah, I'm in total agreement with Fastina. I think that's a huge problem. I think um you know, in my experience, there are lots of rules, quote unquote, rules in journalism that sometimes are followed and sometimes are not. And one of those is having clear respect for when conversations with you or things that you say are on the record um, and when they are not. But in reality, there are so many moments in which um, that is not honored. And I think that's a key piece to include in any response that you make. So whether that's putting out a letter to the editor or forming your own collective statement or alternative media response saying this, this quote was misquoting me or was misrepresenting a conversation I was having with a movement partner um, this journalist did not have the right. I also think we need to see our relationships with journalists as mutually beneficial. And if a journalist does something that you find disrespectful, you can find other relationships with journalists. You know, it's useful for us to have relationships with journalists so that they cover our stories, but also they need contacts within movements in order to make their stories strong. And if a journalist does something in which you think, I no longer trust you to the level where I want to send press releases to you, where I want to turn to you to cover us, that's also power that you have. And I wouldn't underestimate uh, that as a point of leverage to say, you know, I'll just go to a different outlet with my story. Uh, if you continue to disrespect me and my work through misrepresenting us, you, you just won't be writing about um, us in the way that other journalists who I give more access to or give interviews to, um, which is not always, always a response that's possible. It might only be possible for very popular stories, but it is something that I, I hope folks hold on to the power that they have with that as well. Neha, did you have anything uh, you wanted to add to that comment as oh, well? Um, I, I completely agree with you, Mara, but uh, it, it is a relationship that works both ways. And it's always good to remind them of how this, this, this is. Um, while and I'm completely aware that sometimes journalists don't work in the rules of ethics and sometimes they want to, to do a sensational story rather than, than really do the story that they're meant to do. So yeah, it is good to be slightly careful as well when you're around journalists. Um, they do like listening in on conversations, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, but again, Mara, I completely agree with you and your assessment of how this should be managed. I, I wanted to just add to what you were saying. So COP is a specific place where we're starting to see right-wing press showing up. 
And it's always good if you ask, um, the journalists are by law required to say who they are representing. Usually if they're from a conservative paper uh, or like hyper right paper, they will say it very quickly. Um, and then it's very important you get their, their, um, their business card. So I was approached by a news agency called New American and I didn't connect it when I did the interview, but under the interview, they started talking about like what my point of view was on, on binary, like women and men, and it started getting really ugly, their questions. And then um, I had to ask them again. So like it was, uh, it was problematic for me that I didn't connect that these were a problematic agency. And sometimes you don't know, but if you notice that the questions are starting going really nasty, you can ask them to redact you can say like, I don't want to, you to cover my story. I don't want to choose that, but they can go ahead and use it anyway. But yeah, it's always, always important if you, you get their contact names before they start interviewing you. Because in, in COP areas, we're starting to see these horrible journalists showing up. Thanks so much for all of you. Um, on the one hand for the empowering that we also do have power um, an opposite or not an opposite, but also um, towards press. And then on the other hand, also the um, negative developments um, in media and the media space that are, that are going on and which are attacking us. So I think both are really important to take care of. Um, we do have another question from Peck. So she just lowered her hand. So maybe I will just introduce our last slide and just in case, um, you have time, I will just hand over to you. I hope that is fine before doing the closing. Um, because I would like to also advertise our next um, webinar, which is the last part of our webinar series, um, and it will be on storytelling. It will be slightly shorter than the um, previous webinar, so I hope that you can make time and, um, yeah, enrich your um, digital advocacy and traditional media advocacy with storytelling elements. Um, moreover, and I will now come to Ayuska's questions on what the comms team will actually focus on during this year um, when there is no climate conference happening, are a couple of advocacy opportunities that are happening starting in November. There are two two-week events from the um, COP presidency as well as the UNFCCC secretariat and um, during those two event series we will have the opportunity to also put forward our messages and demands because there are a couple of um, critical developments going on in narratives such as for example the discussion on the framing about um, nature-based solutions as well as the net zero um, discussions and um, connected to that, of course, the ambition and new climate targets that are supposed to be updated in the national determined um, contributions this year from countries. So we have not yet had the first coordination meeting. Um, Tara just shared a Google form where you can add your interest to join the communication group and we will have our first meeting soon and discuss about our demands and um, precise strategy on how to go forward. Um, beside the COM team, you can of course also work on um, the elaboration of our positions, which are um, on the one hand on our key demands and message messaging towards the COP presidency, and um, even more important about the um, net zero discussion and nature-based solutions that are going on. There might be also some more positions coming up, um, depending on how the first event series is going in the beginning of November, and we really hope to also flag some important developments um, there to make sure that we really do have the just and feminist transformation now as we are going through the COVID crisis and the climate crisis together. Having that, said that, I would just like to hand over to Peck to maybe either really share a very precise and short question or just type it into the chat box because we will also have time to answer you in written after the webinar.
maybe Peg already had to leave. So I hope we will just get her question afterwards. And having said that, I would like to go to our last slide and just say thank you to all of you that you have joined our second webinar on traditional media advocacy. It has been so inspiring and interesting for me. And um, I really look forward to more being engaged with media directly and make sure that our messages are coming through more precisely and also more prominent into that space. So thanks so much to our speakers, Neha and Mara, and also for doing the poll, Hannah. Of course, also for our accessibility coordinator, Tara, that was, um, who was observing the chat box and made sure that you could all participate into, in the webinar. And last but not least, of course, very much thank you to our interpreters in the Spanish and French channel who made sure that we do not only have the possibility to um, present in English, but also have translations into Spanish and French, and so make it more accessible um, internationally. We really hope that we see you in our next webinar next week. And until then, please feel free to contact all of us individually or directly connect you to the next webinar. And yeah, we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. And please feel free to just wave into the camera if you are still in the meeting. Hey. Thank you. Bye bye. It has been a pleasure to see you all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Very, bye very bye. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Neha and Pat. Thank you. Thank you. I close the meeting now. Bye bye.